So yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Stephanie. When we started talking about uh, this workshop, it's pretty exciting. So thank you for letting me uh, say a few words. And uh, I've loved the discussion so far. And I've gotten so many nice ideas. And I'm making all these mental notes of, oh my god, we have to do something together. And all these like proposal ideas are popping in my head. So I hope we can continue the discussions. So yes, I wanted to share with you a couple of the experiences we had over the last years in the SOURCE program and a couple of the other programs we run here actually at NCAR. And a share a couple of best practices we've identified so far, some of our challenges, and then in the end, kind of an invitation to collaborate and uh, work with us on some of these um, things that we found so far. Um, the SOURCE program, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's an acronym for an awfully long name of a program. It's Significant Opportunities in Atmospheric um, Research and Sciences. And we've been around now for, um, God, what is it, 18 years? Uh, a long time. And um, we were funded originally by the National Science Foundation, which still very generously kept funding us all these years. And uh, we identified together with Dr. Um, Rich Anthes many years ago in 1996 that the atmospheric sciences had a real challenge in terms of diversity. It's still when you walk through this building today, it's pretty obvious. And uh, so this program has been around. We are focusing um, on the transition from college to grad school. And since the, the foundation of the program, since the funding of the program, we've expanded also to transitioning students from high school into college, from two-year colleges into four-year colleges, and then grad school and beyond. So I think the transitioning moments, the, the very crucial points where people might be dropping out of school is kind of what we focus on. And we've developed uh, several mentoring models um, with the original director of the program, Dr. Tom Windham, uh, that I think are pretty unique about SOURCE. Uh, of course, we also do things like scholarships, and we build very supportive cohorts. And what some people don't know is that we are a year-round program. So different from other internships that may be focusing on the summer, our programs reach out to our students year-round. And so far, we've had a pretty good success rate. Over 85% of our participants um, go on to grad school or into the STEM workforce. So I guess that's the reason why we still get funding. Um, as I said, our main funder is the NSF still. Uh, we also are lucky to have funding from agencies like NOAA. And we also get funding from individual PIs here at the universities. And maybe just to put into perspective why I am here. <laughs> I'm running these programs. Um, I'm, I call myself a recovering scientist, so I'm a, a geoscientist uh, by training. But I also double majored in cultural anthropology. Uh, because I, I had this big dream. I told somebody that yesterday, when I was 13, I wanted to save the rainforest. And then I did research internships in Guatemala and realized, wow, there are a lot of people in the forest. So actually, to save the forest, we have to work with people. And people are incredibly complex. And so I got very fascinated by working with people. And so yes, I studied um, cultural anthropology. And I focused especially on the fate of minorities within majority cultures and empowerment of minority cultures. And so I feel sometimes I can still work on these um, issues in these programs. Those of you who know me uh, know that I am a big fan of Dr. Eric Jolly and his theoretical frameworks on how he looks at student success. And maybe because I'm uh, a cultural anthropologist, so a social scientist, um, I need theoretical frameworks when I do work. And so his uh, theory is that programs like ours that try to engage students um, from diverse backgrounds need these three components to be successful. And just with one of these components, you will not uh, get, get as far. So really, his idea is that you need an engagement piece. And I think we've talked a lot about this quite a bit. How do we get students hooked? Once we hook them and we get them interested, <laughs> Ari is laughing, um, we need to make sure they actually have the right skills and the knowledge and the support to be successful. But then, really important and dear to my heart, the continuous support. We cannot do this just once and get somebody excited and then kind of push them out. 
to fight for their, themselves, there needs to be a long-term investment in the support. So this is kind of his idea, and I think I'll uh, structure my talk around uh, this concept. So let's start with the engagement piece, how are we doing? Uh, so you, you'll find a lot of research out there saying that undergraduate research is a nice way to engage students. And there's a lot of documentation out for that. And so having this feeling of being immersed in the culture of research, having the mentorship going to a conference. So I think nobody disputes this fact anymore. But we still have a real problem in getting students from diverse backgrounds even to apply for our internships, correct? So I work with a lot of PIs who run internships, and they all complain about that. I'm putting out these amazing opportunities, and nobody applies. So I did a Google search late at night, and I did an image search. And I think the words I typed in was geoscience jobs. And this is what came up. So there's some oil stuff, oil digging, uh, somebody lost in a snowfield somewhere, another oil thing, and I only see guys. And yeah, so that's what came up. I did the same search for computing jobs and atmospheric science jobs. And the images didn't look any better. This is the first page of a Google result. So I think we still have a lot of stereotypes to overcome. And when I travel and when I speak at high schools and when I speak at community colleges, I always get the feedback, and, and you're familiar with that. I'm kind of preaching to the choir. But I basically get uh, the feedback from students, yeah, my parents don't want me to go into this field. Because um, this is not an area that I should be working in. I should be a lawyer. I should be a doctor. I should not go into something like this. And I think you've also, and, and I love it because we heard it just this morning from our keynote speaker, there is an interest uh, among the student population that we are trying to recruit um, to combine community service and geosciences. So just yesterday, I had to skip out of this workshop to meet with a student to do some career counseling. And he told me, I really want to stay in atmospheric sciences, but I have such a, a desire to give back and to serve society, I'm not quite sure I can do this with atmospheric sciences. But then we look at all the problems that we already encounter. This is a picture of Katrina. This is a poor farmer, I think, in Iowa dealing with drought. Here we have an Alaskan community dealing with um, permafrost melt. That I think we actually have all these problems out there. And we can show our students how they can get involved solving problems that they can give back to their community. I think we just need to get better at making this connection for people. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how we address this in SOARS. So SOARS used to put out projects, like any REU program, and propose projects that the mentors had in mind. And then the students would apply to it. And then a couple of years ago, we decided to turn this on its head. And we now, in the application, we don't publish any projects that students apply to. We ask students, what are you interested in? Write me in your essay what you want to do. And of course, I already have some projects lined up. I just don't show them up front. And what will happen, at least so far, is that about 85% of the students will request a project that is pretty much in line in what we do here at NCAR. So I will have some people who want to do climate modeling, some people who are really passionate about severe weather, and we have those mentors lined up. But we also have students who challenge us and say, I want to do something completely different. I really would like to study. So for example, Saint Mena, here in the photo, said, I would like to understand how climate change is already impacting people on the ground. And I would like to work directly with the community on some solutions. And so we connected her with a good friend of mine, Jonathan Foray, in southern Louisiana. He lives in Homa, which is pretty much if you step one more step, then you fall in the water. Mm. Um, so if you've watched the movie Beast of the Southern Wild, it's right there. And so what she did is she, through many community meetings over two summers, 
she's working with the communities to document all the places in southern Louisiana in this one bayou that are already being lost due to climate change, due to sea level rise, erosion, and all these things that are happening down there. And because she's young and much cooler than I could ever be, and she has all these ideas about new technologies, she said, we need an iPhone app. I don't want to do boring GIS mapping and show a PowerPoint talk. This has to be on a phone. So we just prototyped this. It's trademarked. And we just got an extra grant to actually hire a programmer to make this good for consumption. So basically what happens is people can walk around, document a point that is important to them. Let's say an old cemetery that is already this high underwater, and they have to build a little wall around it to protect it. And then we can upload images and descriptions of the place. And what I think is really cool, a couple of YouTube videos about the place. And this project has gotten more media attention than any other project we've ever done in source. We were on national television. We had over 30 news articles. And it's going on and on. So I think this is a proof that if we let students actually drive our research, we can get pretty far with this. The second piece around capacity building. So now we have a student hooked in, and we bring him here. And how do we actually make sure um, that they can succeed in our field? And we had some discussions yesterday about barriers of entry, math deficiency, people having to catch up, all of those things. And so what I think about is, do you actually ask your question, your students, the question, what do you need to succeed in my program? And ask yourself, your program, your department, your lab, wherever you are, what accommodations are you actually willing to make? So I get a lot of feedback because I talk to a lot of grad schools. Well, like we had to reject your student. You've invested all these years into your student. He's an excellent researcher. But he's missing this one math class that we absolutely have as a prereq on our admission standards. OK, you just lost out on an amazing student. So what accommodations are we willing to make? And how do we predict success? Somebody, I think Caroline, mentioned yesterday the new study that GRE scores are kind of the worst predictor of success in grad school. But we're still using it. And I, I understand we need some sort of numerical value because we want to be fair. But are we really looking at the whole student when we admit them? And also, you might wonder, why is a student not even applying to my program? And I sometimes feel that your application requirements itself on your website show what you value. So if they're not applying to your summer program, because all you're asking for is GPAs, and if you have previous research experience, you might be missing out on people who value something very different. Are you asking for leadership skills? And asking you for a commitment to community service in your applications? And are you truly valuing these things equally than some numerical values? And as an example, I have here an incredibly successful student who dropped out of high school, got her GED, then went to college, went to Colorado School of Mines, and is now a PhD student at CU Boulder in Atmospheric Sciences. And she had a hard time getting into grad schools. And inofficially, I was told later, well, because she has a kid. Can she really focus? She's part Hispanic, part Native American, 4.0 student. I think she can handle grad school. But what are our criteria for, for uh, admitting students? And how much are we willing to accommodate somebody who might have to run home at 3 o'clock to get somebody out of childcare? And I know that now we have discussions with NSF and among in our community that we want to attract more non-traditional students, especially if we're looking at community college students, which right now I think is, is quite a conversation, quite a push with all of us. And I think if we really want to do this, we need, again, to look within ourselves and our programs and have these conversations. Are we really willing to support these students? And how far will we go? So I have a gentleman in my program, Stan Edwin, who is pretty much the leading elder in his community 
um, far up north, close to the Yukon River in Alaska. And if something big happens in his community during the summer, he needs to fly home. One time there was a funeral, and he had to oversee this funeral. So you have extra cost that you need to accommodate, and you need to be willing, and you need to work with the mentors that signed up to mentor the student to say, OK, we'll handle this somehow. And we did. And he is now um, a graduate student in Fairbanks, Alaska in math. So these are just things that I think we need to keep in mind. I think we also have a mandate now from NSF, and I'm very happy about that, to support the veterans from the recent wars. And just ask yourself, are you ready to really support these students? I had no idea how to deal with PTSD issues. I learned that last year. And I'm happy to say that we got through it, but it's stuff that we, in theory, are all supportive about it. Are we really ready for it? And I just threw in something fun. I wanted to show you something. Uh, we had a discussion yesterday about um, are we asking students to leave who they are at the door when they enter science, our science field? And um, I smiled because we actually do quite a lot of activities in source to reflect um, upon things like what are our values and who are we as a person when we come and do we have to leave this at the door and of course our uh, my value is no, you, you are a whole person when you come in. And so, uh, show of hands, have you ever done the Wheel of Life? <laughs> my two students, yes. <laughs> okay, go online, Google Wheel of Life. You can download um, these, uh, this format, and you can pretty much fill in whatever uh, values or, or issues you want to see here. Basically, the idea, just if you've never done it, is from a scale to 1 to 10, how well are you doing taking care of your family? How much are you seeing your friends? Uh, how much fun do you have? So whoever filled this out had really no fun. Besides not you. <laughs> you know, actually, if I would do this, I would say, since I work in education, that means I don't get paid well, and I work way too much, my health is probably somewhere here, my finances here. <laughs> so I'm fulfilled, but poor and happy. Um, and, <laughs> but if you see this, uh, issues like your community and your spirituality is on there. And so what you do when you review these things with students is that, A, people get to reflect, how well am I doing? But you're also communicating a value of your program. You don't have to leave these issues behind when you enter the door and you join us. Another thing that I'm thinking a lot about this year is how can we adapt our traditional our use, so our research experiences to the community college um, population. And uh, we just here in March had a conversation with uh, quite a lot of pretty much all of the PIs that run GeoRUs. And this was a huge breakout session. We all discussed it. Nobody really has the answers. And so what I'm trying out this year is what I call the Source Academy. I just finished it last Saturday. <laughs> That was exhausting, yes. And uh, what we're doing is a combination of elements that we've experimented with. So we're bringing in students for one week. And I thought it was a bit short, so we might need to do two weeks next year. But students get to explore science careers. We actually did some hands-on science. You see the cohort here chasing a storm with a Doppler on wheels. Uh, they got great mentoring by uh, scientists, and I will take them all to AMS, to the student conference, so they get to experience um, a conference. And different from just a one-week immersion program is that we will keep the year-round support Source provides for them. So we will have webinars. I travel a lot. I will check and meet these students. And then we meet them all up again. And so we actually, this is a research project. So we're having a front and back evaluation just to see if this works. Because NSF asked me, Rebecca, I want to know, what are you going to do for community college students? And I said, well, let me try something. And what I really love is that just in March, I met Jeremy at a conference here in Boulder. And we agreed that we want to try this out. We wrote a grant together, so hopefully this gets funded for his students to run something like this. 
and he already sent me three of his students for this for this cohort. So it was really fun. Um, I, we got a lot of feedback from the students. They really enjoyed it. And I pulled out this quote because this really represented the overall feeling of the cohort. Yes, they loved the research. That was great. Great experience to play with the Doppler. But they really cared mostly about the cohort building. And now that they feel part of a family, this isolated experience they may, they may have in their own colleges of being the only one of something was overcome by coming here. This is kind of cool. And it worked in one week. So this is a topic uh, dear to my heart, uh, supporting students um, with diverse abilities. And uh, partially because I have a physical disability that I had to overcome. And I was told never to hike and never to go out. And still, I wanted to become a geoscientist. And so I sent pictures of myself up on a volcano to my doctors. It's like, here I am. <laughs> so this is really important to me. Um, I think, again, this is all doable. It's pretty exciting. You just have to be ready and prepare your lab or your grad school for it. And I actually love universal design issues. And we have, I have learned great uh, things by bringing in students with uh, diverse abilities into our program. This is Roque Cespedes, who is a PhD student in Miami. And actually, uh, Rich mentored him uh, during his time here. And I just wanted to share that there's great new stuff done in accessible field trips, in case you want to check that out. Uh, one of our colleagues, Chris Atchison, is just offering a fully accessible field trip um, with NSF funding at the upcoming GSA conference. So I think he's still taking sign-ups for that, if you're interested. And so the last piece, and I'm going to hurry up because I already got a sign, is the continuity piece. Um, how much are we really supporting our students long term? And just this is kind of my soapbox. Academic process takes time. If you haven't noticed, it takes a while to get a PhD. So <laughs> we, uh, we started this horse program. And say if we had been on a three-year grant, this would have been our result. We would have had a couple of bachelor's degrees and one or two masters, and that would have been it, and that would have been my report. Uh, thanks uh, to generous support from the NSF, we've been able to run these all these years. And you see that after nine years of the program, we saw the first PhDs coming in. And now, actually, 14, we have a huge bubble. Um, we're going to have this graphic. It's going to look very different because we have um, about 30 PhDs in the, pro in the making that are coming up this year. So it takes time programs take time to deliver results. And my question for us as a community is, are we really willing to make these long-term investments? Or are we looking for small efforts? And if it doesn't work right away, we stop funding this project. And so just to give you an example, Chris Castro, he was one of our very first interns. And he's now a professor. That alone would be a great story to tell. I downloaded all the pictures of his um, grad students that he now is hiring. And I think if you see the multiplier effect, the values that he has himself, and now he is hiring a super diverse cohort. So yes, we invested in him in 1996 and see what happened. He originally wanted to work in the insurance industry. Huh? And so through internships, he got passionate and see the impact he's having. And real quick, I'm always asked, how do we scale this up? Uh, one of the ideas is to replicate some of the things we've been doing in source and other programs. So we got very lucky to work with NEON and UNAFGO to replicate our programs adapted to the ecology and the solid earth sciences. Uh, we also have very successful and meaningful partnerships now with several minority serving institutions. Uh, here we have uh, Michael Twofeather, who came from Haskell Indian Nations for last week's program out. These are all of our satellite and partner programs um, where we're either positioning students or we're working with them. And for example, Woods Hole uh, now is building a little mini source. So they already have three students out there. Uh, 
And that's purely self-serving. I love going to the beach, so I decided to, I need to build a program somewhere where there's an ocean. Um, and uh, the little dots just show you all the students and the universities that are currently working with us this summer. And uh, we are also supporting faculty. Um, we got a nice grant from uh, the National Science Foundation to provide workshops for every PI that has a grant for RU work in GEO. And we had wonderful discussions just in March here. And uh, we got a follow-up grant to develop online resources and training at the AGU fall meeting. And this doesn't have to be limited just to GEO um, PIs. I think anybody should use these resources, and I will share them with you once they're online. And here I had some questions for the group, maybe for our discussions later, because Stephanie asked me to include some questions. And I think I made it right on time. Thank you. <clears throat> we do have a few minutes for questions. Questions? Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to echo the comment that the um, non-traditional students uh, programs do, and I think I mentioned this in my talk as well, they, they do cost a bit more because you have to and you know do something like extra trips or some time away. So I completely agree with that, but I, I think that that's an essential part of it. I don't know any other way to deal with that. The other thing I wanted to say about Roque because he was, he was, uh, uh, I had the privilege of, of mentoring him. And, um, you know, the technology issue there, he was in a position where initially people were, he, he's not easy to understand when he speaks. And he was in a position where they were going to excuse him from giving his presentation, which is a, was a central part of your, your program in SOARS, is you have to give a presentation at the end. And, um, the technology that was brought into play there was 39 bucks. It allowed him, at that time, it was just to be able to read PowerPoint with a voice. That's all it was. And his talks were so clear that Rick Anthes, the president of UCAR at the time, when he heard that talk, he was like, you really should give this software to all of our students because, <laughs> <laughs> because the presentation was substantially clearer than what people trying to talk extemporaneously because they were essentially prepared remarks. So yeah. I just think a lot of these things have really simple fixes to them. You know, if you just are mindful of, of not sort of accepting that that's going to prevent them from doing the thing. So thank you. Just a couple comments. But thank you. And I also love that he could pick the accent of the voice that was reading his PowerPoints. Yeah, yeah. So he ended up with kind of a James Bond-like character <laughs> reading his slides. Yeah, he could have given himself a German accent. Yeah. Denise, you have a question oh, over there, okay. but really quickly before we go to the next question, you know what a champion I am for the 2IC and non-traditional community. I wanted to know with the uh, work that you're doing with Jeremy and um, the pilot um, that you're running with the <clears throat> students, how involved are you with the mentors that they get or how, um, the support that they're getting um, year-round at their institution? How closely are you working with their teachers and or mentors? Um, well, it's kind of a, uh, two, two separate issues, I think. So the Source Academy itself, they all have a mentor here from NCAR, and that mentor will stay in contact year-round, plus our staff. So we'll have a lot of webinars, and we have uh, those kind of things. And then plus the students that Jeremy is taking on, they have, he is a kind of in charge of the mentors who then take on his RU students. So there we engage in a partnership with another faculty who shares the same values and then oversees that. I don't think we from our side would have the capacity to kind of oversee all the mentors out there. I think that's where the strong partnerships come in place. It's the same what we do with Haskell Indian Nations. Um, we have a colleague at University of Kansas who then takes care of that year-round piece there. Thank you. Our last question. Oh, I, I've been a, a fan, of course, of SOARS right from the start. 
I wanted to sort of know, uh, has NSF sort of used the SOARS model to implement in other programs uh, at the foundation? 